In this lecture, we will learn about X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. As we realize, there are three terms out here, X-ray, photoelectron and spectroscopy. So, in this particular process, we utilize X-rays to excite a particular material, then utilize the uh, effect of photoelectron, like uh, have, have the photoelectron get emitted from the surface and from then we achieve a spectrum or the being able to analyze the spectrum that is spectroscopy. So, we are utilizing X-rays and then from that we are generating a photo electron and from the photo electron we are basically going on to achieving a spectrum to uh, 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 eventually analyze the overall spectrum and find out the chemical composition of a particular material. So, in this XP, XPS electron, uh, XPS is also called ESCA that is electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis. So, in this particular technique we are utilizing X-ray to excite a particular material, then generate photo electrons and eventually get a spectrum to finally evolve with the chemical analysis. It is also called electron spectroscopy because electron which is emitted as a photo electron that is being captured for the eventual chemical analysis of a particular material. So, via XPS we can uh, analyze uh, its elemental composition, we can eventually come up with the chemical formula which is empirical in nature and also we can determine the chemical or electronic state of the elements. So, these are the advantages of utilizing XPS, uh, because in XPS uh, it is highly uh, dependent on the electronic, electronic state of the element as well. So, we can easily determine what is the overall nature of a particular element and what is its electronic state or therefore, the, thereby we can also calculate what is, what is, what is its chemical formula. Uh, coming to the features of XPS, uh, it can uh, it is highly surface sensitive. So, we can uh, perform a surface analysis we can eventually also see what are the contaminants those of that are present on the surface of a material and we can also determine the ele elemental composition which is limited to the top 10 nanometer of the surface. And since the uh, electrons which are emitted they are low energy electrons and to uh, detect those electrons which, uh, which are uh, coming out of the surface without any uh, collisions in elastic collisions, we require a ultra high vacuum which is to the order of 10 to the power minus 9 tor. So, that much a vacuum level is required by the uh, system, so that uh, electron which is coming out of the surface of a material that uh, comes out without any inelastic collisions and the mean elastic free path, the mean free path of the particular electron is to the order of many, many kilometers around 30 or 40 kilometers. So, that is the reason uh, that electron can traverse and it can come back to the detector and its sensitivity its parts per thousand. So, we can go up to uh, 0 0.01 percent of a particular material and then works on the photoelectric effect and that uh, photoelectric effect is being uh, initiated via application of X-ray photon and then uh, it provides a spectrum of the binding energy versus the number of electrons which are em being emitted per unit time. So, from these two phenomena uh, of uh, finding the binding energy versus the number of electrons which are, which are being generated per unit time, we can get a spectrum and that, that is helpful in analyzing the overall spectrum you, you, uh, via XPS. And surface chemical composition, uh, basically uh, if you want to go for uh, describing the complete description of the surface, uh, we can get a structural information, we also need uh, ele elemental or molecular compositions and uh, there are certain techniques which are dependent on the electron spectroscopy such as ESC as well. Uh, in those, uh, in ESC we utilize X-rays, but there are certain techniques where we can uh, use electrons as incident and in this case for XPS, we are utilizing e electrons as the particle which is being detected and that uh, elect since electron is a low energy, uh, it can be a low energy uh, particle which is coming out. So, we can uh, uh, utilize them in exploiting the surface sensitivity. So, we utilize the low energy electrons and then they become they are highly sensitive such as uh, OJ electrons or photo electron and from that we can limit the interaction with the material to the order of few uh, angstroms or nanometers and then it, the overall uh, sensitivity goes up by a huge number, uh, because there are low energy electrons and we can exploit to eventually find out the surface sensitivity. And again the distance uh, the electron is traveling, it, uh, it depends on the kind of material it is interacting with. If a material has a much higher uh, density, then there will be many, many num more number of collisions on the surface itself and the penetration of electron into the material will be very, very less. And the kinetic energy of electron which is coming out will be very high if the binding energy is very low. So, that thing is also that thing is also very essential in terms of finding out what is the kinetic energy of the outcoming electron. 
uh, since the electron has to come out from the shell and if the binding energy is very high, then the overall kinetic energy will be very, very less. So, that is the overall thing, uh, which uh, a distance uh, electron will travel depends on and uh, sensitivity is to the order of uh, very, very less. Uh, it is actually, uh, it can go down to around 40 nanometer by synchrotron facility and identification at concentrations greater than 0.1 atomic percent and with the quantification of plus minus 10 percent. And in this particular method, we utilize photo emission. So, we have, we are incidenting a photon and particle which is coming out is an electron and uh, basically uh, we see uh, uh, excitation of electron and then uh, that basically uh, an other electron fills up the core electron and then it finds out the what is the status of the field core, uh, what are the field core levels and this overall technique is being utilized in the XPS. And there are certain loss processes which are also associated in the XPS. Uh, those arise because of the inelastic scattering and because of inelastic scattering, uh, there is reduction in the kinetic energy of the electron and also it might trap the uh, traveling electron it, it, and it may prevent the escape of electron from the surface. So, these are also some, uh, some of the things which can happen and those inelastic scattering can occur either via phonon, plasmon. So, those excitations can also absorb some certain energy uh, in terms of their excitation uh, as atoms in unit cell or excitation of electrons. So, and they also have a different energy levels out here. And uh, coming to the inelastic mean free path uh, versus the kinetic energy, we can see that uh, if we start drawing a mean free path. So, we have a mean free, uh, mean free path, uh, we, which is denoted by lambda and it is given in distance such as angstrom and then we have say electron energy in E v. So, we, we see that uh, when the uh, electron energy is very, very less, the electron will undergo many, many collisions and when the electron energy is very, very high, it will penetrate much deeper into the material. So, for higher ele energy electrons, we will see that there are very high interactions because uh, higher energy of electrons will allow uh, the much more penetration of the electron into the material. So, uh, what will happen that uh, now electron will uh, basically, once it has to come out of the surface, it will undergo many, many collisions. What happens at lower levels is that it is, uh, it is, it is such a low energy that it just after certain inelastic collisions, it basically dies away. So, that is the problem with the electron energy at, uh, at lower energy, it can just keep going further and further into, uh, into the material and uh, basically it will get uh, much, uh, it, it will just keep uh, colliding with the uh, things around and it will, uh, it is with such a low energy, it will get just uh, uh, deflected by the electrons which are nearby and the energy is not sufficient to basically collide with uh, some other material and lose its energy. And in this case, it has such a high energy that it will keep traversing to a very high distances without uh, uh, without uh, affect without affecting its energy, and then basically this energy uh, keeps drying uh, later on. But at, in this particular location, we are seeing the mean free path is very very low. So what is happening is if we can attain a particular electron with uh, certain energy, we are observing the minimum uh, mean free path. It means the electron will collide with the uh, surface and it will come out only from this particular regime. And we realize that this, this amount is around 5 to 10 nanometer, 5 to 10 angstroms and this particular part can go as high as maybe say around 10 nanometer. So, if we can capture an electron within this particular regime, which is uh, predominant for maybe uh, electro, electron energies to the order of uh, 50 to under, around 100 eV, we can capture an electron with a very low mean free path and we can get th this much sensitivity for the particular process. So, this tells the importance of the mean free path versus the electron energy or the electron uh, kinetic energy out here in this particular case. So, we are getting a minimum uh, uh, intense uh, minimum mean free path of around 5 to 10 angstroms for kinetic energy in to the order of 50 to 100 eV and that will provide us the maximum sensitivity. So, that is the key part around here that we can also get very high sensitivity in this particular case. Now, uh, in one of the uh, earlier lectures, we have uh, uh, studied about the OJ electron spectroscopy and in there we realize how uh, relaxation process can lead to a OJ electron. So, we see that uh, we have uh, certain shells out here, uh, we have certain shells out here and then we uh, we excite a particular uh, electron, we had a core shell electron, we supply a beam of a photon with energy h mu and then we see that this uh, uh, particular electron is knocked away and since this is knocked away, an electron, what can happen is later on that it can, uh, one electron can jump from high energy 
to a lower energy and then it can basically supply certain h mu that will come go out as a x ray fluorescence and the electron which is emitted out is nothing but the photo uh, photo electron which is basically emitted out and this energy can again be uh, absorbed by an electron in the higher shell and that can come out as a oj electron so we see that this particular electron which is coming out is a photo electron and we are interested mostly in this part because uh, we are capturing the energy of the photo electron in the oj electron the basically its kinetic energy was dependent only on the shells which were belonging to the k shell and l1 and l2 shells so we had uh, something like this that the energy of kinetic energy of the foot, uh, of the oj electron was dependent on the binding energy of the k shell minus binding energy of the l1 and minus binding energy of the l2 but in this particular case since we are bombarding with certain energy h mu and that particular energy is being utilized to knock off that particular photo electron the kinetic energy of a photo electron basically depends on the applied energy as well so we had h mu minus the binding energy of the k shell minus some work function required to go from to escape to, to the from fermi level to the vacuum level so how this thing is particularly happening is uh, we did see that that uh, we have h mu which is uh, interacting with the core shell and that core shell electron is basically being knocked off as a photo electron so uh, so that's what uh, we did see that and xps as we said earlier it is also called electron spectros spectroscopy for chemical analysis it is a semi quantitative technique for determining the composition based on the photoelectric effect and based it is based on the electron spectroscopy because we utilize electron as a detector and we are using the detect uh, detecting particles as electrons and they are able to exploit the surface sensitivity because the signal is coming out only from the top 5 to 10 angstroms of the surface so seeing about the photo emission part we had this uh, vacuum level and then we go on to the fermi level and then we see the k shell or the core level shell electrons so we uh, we see that the core core hole is being created we take this core hole that thing is being uh, eliminated once we apply a electron uh, we once we apply some h mu that electron basically goes and escapes as a photo electron and again going from the uh, binding energy uh, up to here it has to come to uh, overcome the binding energy plus it has to utilize certain work function to be able to achieve certain energy still with itself and that thing is nothing but the kinetic energy which is being possessed by the photo electron so once this particular photo electron is emit, uh, getting emitted it has to overcome the barrier of the binding energy of a particular shell and then overcome the certain work function and then the remaining energy so we have total energy of the kinet, uh, of the photo electron kinetic energy is equal to h mu minus ionization potential for gases and it is equal to h mu minus binding energy minus some work function for solids so we say that photo emission will occur only when our h mu is greater than the work function and then binding energy plus work function is smaller than the h mu then we have a photo emission or in other words we don't get any photo emission when h mu is lesser than uh, work function and be the binding energy plus work function is greater than h mu so for photo emission we need to have the electron to overcome the binding energy plus the work function which is required for its emission and that basically comes out to be the kinetic energy the remaining energy becomes the kinetic energy of the electron once it is being ejected from the uh, from the vacuum level so this is what the overall process is we have a incident photon which strikes onto the core shell knocks off an electron and that electron has to overcome the binding energy plus certain work, work function for solids in being able to be uh, in being able to escape from the surface so that is basically overcoming binding energy plus some work function to basically emer emerge from the vac to a vacuum level so that is what uh, is photo emission is all about so it is uh, defined in uh, three steps mechanism of photo emission 
we have first of all the absorption and ionization. So, that creates the initial core level hole and now the material has to relax itself. So, there is some response of the atom in terms of creating the photo electron. So, we have emission of photo electron here and now the third thing is the uh, relaxation, the transport of electron to the surface and escape. So, in this case it is overcoming the binding energy plus some work function so, that becomes the extrinsic losses uh, uh, of the particular electron that comes by phonon or uh, uh, phonon uh, and plasmon uh, interactions. And now the requirement uh, of the uh, XPS uh, in terms of leading to photoelectric effect. So, we have this kinetic energy of photoelectron it increases as the binding energy decreases. It is very obvious because we are applying the, uh, the kinetic energy of a photoelectron is equal to h mu minus binding energy minus the work function. So, uh, obviously, if uh, our binding energy is getting uh, lower and lower, our the overall uh, kinetic energy will keep increasing to the extent. And again the photo emission is proportional to the intensity of photons. So, if you have more number of photons, there are more number of electrons which will uh, go out as a photo electron. And in this particular case, we need a monochromatic x-ray, uh, monochromatic x-ray incident beam. Why? Because if we have a variety of uh, variety of x-ray beam, then the overall energy will be very, very different. So, we have P e is equal to h mu minus B e minus work function. So, for h mu itself is varying, it is very difficult to trace what is the overall kinetic energy of the photo electron. So, in that particular case, the detection would not be that good and we will not, uh, we will get a variable uh, in terms of the kinetic energy values and that will basically tell us oh the electron is coming from somewhere else, whereas it is coming from a specific uh, specific chemical. So, that one uh, we need to have a monochromatic x-ray source. So, we, we know what is the incident energy and that will basically decide the energy of a outcoming photo electron and that will help us correlate what is the relation between the two and that particular difference will tell us the exact chemical nature of the particular element. And a range of kinetic energy can be produced if the valence band is broad. So, depending on the valence band itself, we uh, it the since the material has to overcome the work function as well and it has to overcome the binding energy as well. So, the valence band is pretty broad, broad then again the kinetic energy will be lower and we will get a range instead of a unique value. And again the each element has a unique core set of uh, core levels. So, the kinetic energy can be easily used to fingerprint an element. So, once we know the what is the binding energy, what are the core energy level, uh, core energy levels, then we can obviously find what is the element and what the kinetic energy the uh, ex uh, exiting electron will possess. So, that provides the overall uh, requirements of the XPS process. And again binding energy represents the interaction between the electron and the nuclear charge. And in gases, our binding energy is equal to the ionization potential, but in case of solids, it has to also over overcome certain work function. So, binding energy uh, will, will be uh, uh, the overall energy which has electron has to overcome will be binding energy plus some work function. And binding energy will follow the levels such as B e binding energy of 1 s uh, shell is much higher than 2 s shell. That is the reason first electron goes to 1 s level and then once the 1 s level is filled, it starts filling 2 s level. So, this one has the highest binding energy and similarly it uh, follows on 2 p 3 s and so on. And again binding energy of the orbital increases with the atomic number. So, for a similar uh, row of uh, elements, if we have sodium, magnesium. So, sodium will have the lower binding energy because here the nuclear charge is around uh, of 11 and then uh, we have electrons also 11. So, as soon as the charge gets increasing like in magnesium we have 12 atomic number 12. So, we have 12 nucleons, uh, nucle uh, nucleons that basically neutrons and protons that are uh, attracting the electrons. So, in this particular case the binding energy is much higher. Similarly, it goes on like that. So, we have binding energy increasing with the atomic number and also uh, as the uh, it also follows the energy level. So, that we have 1 s uh, will have much bi higher binding energy than that of a 2 s and then 2 p and so on. So, again uh, we also see that the binding energy how it basically changes. So, if we have a certain counting rate on the uh, on the y axis counting rate or maybe some intensity and in this case we have a kinetic energy. So, we are seeing the binding energy the binding energy increases as we have lower 
atomic number for a particular uh, row of elements. So, we see that the kinetic energy will be very, very low for element with a higher atomic number. So, we have higher atomic number will have a lower kinetic energy. This is a kinetic energy because this one will have a higher binding energy. So, say if, say if say we, say we had a chloride, uh, we had a chlorine and then uh, we see it, uh, see it that it will have a very low, the electron which is coming out in chlor chlorine will have a lower uh, kinetic energy than say material which, which was say magnesium. So, it is, uh, it is much easier, uh, it is much easier for the electron to come out in magnesium, which it is much difficult for the electron to come out in chloride ion. So, uh, that is what the problem is, that the kinetic energy of easily releasable electrons such as uh, Na, Na plus, Na or magnesium, it is very easy for the electron to really come out in sodium and magnesium. So, they will possess very high kinetic energy, since they have lower binding energy of the electron. And similarly, like for ions such uh, for the uh, material such as uh, chloride, uh, chlorine or sulfur or phosphorus, they uh, again they have, they are, the atomic number is much higher. So, their kinetic energies will be much lesser than those of the magnesium or sodium and basically uh, we have uh, seeing higher binding energy in th th this direction and higher kinetic energy in the this direction, because that is what we uh, always say that kinetic energy is equal to h mu minus the binding energy minus the potential of the uh, material. So, that is what we are able to see that binding energy is uh, being affected by the atomic number of the material. But again, binding energy of the orbital, it will not be affected by isotopes, because say binding energy of lithium, as in case of uh, lithium, we know that the what is the overall number of nucleons uh, and protons out there. So, the attraction which with which it will attract the electrons will be the same. So, it does not matter if lithium has so many number of uh, electrons on the surface, it will have the same binding energy, because the way uh, nucleons will, uh, nucleus uh, will uh, keep retaining those electrons will be same. So, we have a binding energy of 7 lithium 1 s is similar to that of 6 lithium 1 s. And again uh, seeing the binding energy with respect to uh, atomic number, we will see that the binding energy will in this direction and then we have atomic number in this direction. So, we will see that the 1 s uh, shell basically comes out like this and then 2 s 2 p will go, go on like this, 2 s will be like this and 2 p it may there may be again some splitting between the uh, shells. So, we will see 2 p uh, will have basically splitting out here and then again 3 s and then again 3 p will have again the splitting part. Again it can be 3 d uh, will have again splitting uh, 3 s or 2 s. So, something like this will uh, something like this will observe in case of uh, particular uh, particular materials and these transitions uh, are basically the way the binding energy is defined. And, uh, so, binding energy versus electron atomic number is something like this that uh, 1 s will have the highest binding energy if we take a particular material, then uh, we can say definitely that 1 s has the highest binding energy than the 2 s and then the 2 p and so on. And that is what we were seeing uh, earlier as well, uh, that is what we have stated earlier as well. So, and coming to the uh, x p s spectrum, we, we count the number of electrons per unit, per unit time with respect to the binding energy of a particular material. So, we see a spectrum which is uh, which appear mo uh, uh, which appear more like this. We see much higher background in certain material and and certain uh, splits like this and then certain change in the background uh, background scale and then again certain scale will go on like this. So, we are seeing binding energy like this and then number of electrons which are again it is being again normalized by the energy levels out here. So, we some spectrum something like this. So, we see that the background is basically keeps changing for different levels. So, and again we are seeing certain peak splitting. So, we if say this was for 2 p 1 by 2 and then 2 p 3 by 2, we see some splitting of the peaks at certain locations. So, uh, so this is what uh, basically happens that we have a uh, stepped background and then second case we have splitting of the peak. So, we have peak splitting as well. So, we are seeing these two parts, peak splitting and the stepped background in this particular case. And why does this happen? We will see as we go along. So, this, this is, uh, let us uh, see. 
and in the background signal it generally in the XPS spectra we see a stepped background. This happens because of the inelastic processes and uh, basically it what happens the electrons which are close to surface they can escape without energy loss and electrons which are much deeper in, in uh, deeper in surface they lose energy and emerge with reduced kinetic energy. So, that is what is happening that uh, once we have an electron uh, say uh, a binding energy uh, which, which has a binding energy of uh, very high such as 1 s electron and those electrons will undergo very very high collisions and they will go much because since they have much uh, higher binding energy it under, undergoes uh, it emerges with a very low kinetic energy. Since it is a very low kinetic energy it again starts interacting with the material and depending on its mean free, mean free path it uh, encounters many many elastic collisions. And as we say, as we say, so as we had seen earlier, that a certain energy range of electrons will have the minimum uh, mean free path. It basically starts losing energy in terms of uh, inelastic uh, collisions, and that part is basically emerging in the 1s uh, much strongly than that of a 2s and then 2p and so on. So uh, electrons which uh, which have which which have very lower binding energy, such as 2p, 3s, 3d, all those shells, they tend to show very low. Uh, uh, binding energy, so uh, very uh, very low uh, uh, background. So in this particular case, if you see, if this is for 2p or 2s or, or that particular level, this will be 3s, 3d, 3p, and then we have 4s, 4p, and so on. So this particular uh, thing basically comes uh, like this, that we see a particular level of uh, background in certain materials. Uh, this one might be for uh, say 2s. This one might be for 2p. And then again, we keep going down, and then we again see certain more uh, interaction in terms of 3s, 3p with varying level of backgrounds. And as we see that for higher uh, for higher uh, shell uh, for higher uh, electronic orbitals, we are seeing uh, that the binding energy is very very low. So that is the reason the background also is very very low because electrons are coming out at very higher energies, and it is easier to detect uh, those higher energies. So that is the reason we are able to see a stepped background. Because the overall intensity at which the electrons will come out will depend on the binding energy of the particular material. So, that is the reason we see that 2s uh, will have uh, much higher background than 2p, and generally 3s uh, shells will have much uh, lower background than the, that of 2s or 2p, and uh, so on. And again, increased binding energy electrons they go very deep in surface and they lose all the energy, and it becomes very difficult for them to escape. So, that is the reason uh, since they have uh, now very low energy left with them because of their increased binding energy, it tends to have a very higher background. So, that is the reason uh, we are not get, uh, getting all the electrons back, which we which were uh, really released. So, that is the reason it gives out a low, uh, low energy uh, electron as a higher background. And that is the reason we tend to basically normalize it with respect to the energy level. So, we have number of electrons which are emerging with respect to the energy and that basically gives out a better uh, signal out there. And as we see, uh, as we saw earlier, that if you have a particular surface and then the electrons which are coming out from uh, surface they they are generally more intense and as soon as we start going much deeper into the material we see that the intensity will keep decreasing but at the same time the 2s will uh, will have a very low uh, kind of uh, energy left with it then again we'll have 3s and then 3p and then 3s and so on so we tend to see a stepped background which will the stepped background will appear more like this uh, we will have splitting for the like if this this is say for 2s then for 2p we will have again a splitting and then we see uh, some background like this and then again 3s and then 3p and so on so we had this binding energy like this and then the overall intensity in this particular direction and that's what we see that the 3p will show the least uh, background whereas 2s and 2p uh, electrons will show a highest background and again uh, coming to the probability of electron which is coming out uh, with a certain kinetic energy without energy loss. So, that particular intensity is given by i is equal to i naught exponential of minus d by lambda cos theta. What is happening is we are taking a particular incident beam, incident photon and the way it is interacting with the material and it will have certain depth till which it goes. So, that depth is basically given by say uh, a particular distance d and then we are achieving certain, uh, we are applying certain photon and that basically photon is getting released. So, we have h mu which is being incident on the material, then we have photon which is getting released uh, with certain angle 
and that that is what is defining the overall uh, release of a electron from the material. So, this is the overall depth from which the electron can escape. So, we have uh, h mu the energy of the photon incident photon and that is interacting with the material and the intensity which is coming out is being defined as i. So, i naught is the incident and i is the intensity which is coming out. So, we see when uh, d is lambda when the depth d is equal to lambda which is equal to the uh, wavelength of the incident uh, thing incident uh, beam and then we get that uh, i by i naught it basically comes out to be 63.3 percent. So, it means that when the depth is equal to lambda we are getting information from 63.3 percent of the depth. So, as we go along and we see d is equal to 2 lambda and d is equal to 3 lambda. Basically, at 3 lambda, we are seeing that the most of the information is coming from the depth of around 3 lambda. So, we are getting around 95 percent of the information which is coming out from the 3 lambda surface. So, this tells that how closely it basically dependent on the incident beam energy. So, the overall information which is uh, emerging, it is only from the distance of 3 times lambda. So, if you can choose the lambda accordingly, say in, in certain case we want to have lambda of around 1.54 angstrom such as for copper uh, K alpha radiation, then we can see that the overall information will be limited only to around 4.5 angstrom. That decides the overall sensitivity. So, if we, we are able to uh, capture the information only from a surface specific layer 4.5 angstroms. So, that tells the how much we can really be able we are able to contain the information uh, the chemical information from only a couple of less than a nanometer layer and uh, less than a nanometer and then we can get the overall uh, depth information from around 4.5 angstrom in case of copper k alpha. So, that is what uh, tells the probability of electron which in which is coming out uh, with kinetic energy. So, this tells that how closely it basically dependent on the incident beam energy. So, the overall information which is uh, emerging it is only from the distance of 3 times lambda. So, if you can choose the lambda accordingly, say in, in certain case we want to have lambda of around 1.54 angstrom such as for copper uh, K alpha radiation, then we can see that the overall information will be limited only to around 4.5 angstrom. That decides the overall sensitivity. So, if we, we are able to uh, capture the information only from a surface specific layer 4.5 angstroms. So, that tells the how much we can really be able we are able to contain the information uh, the chemical information from only a couple of less than a nanometer layer and uh, less than a nanometer and then we can get the overall uh, depth information from around 4.5 angstrom in case of copper K alpha. So, that is what uh, tells the probability of electron which in which is coming out uh, with kinetic energy without with without energy loss and that thing how sense how much it is dependent on the our incident beam and the overall lambda which defines the uh, beam uh, incident photon beam. And again in this case we uh, observe uh, orbital splitting, we have uh, orbital angular momentum and then we have also electron which is being spinning on its shell in a certain direction. So, we see uh, there can be some favorable straight and there can be some unfavorable state. So, we have say if we have in, uh, the orbital which is moving in this direction and say so we have electron which is moving exactly opposite to it, spinning exactly opposite to it, then it is much more aligned and this one will face much lesser uh, resistance uh, during the spinning. But if we had uh, uh, we if we had the moment something like this of the angular momentum uh, more like this and if we have the spin in the same direction at certain location it will cause some friction between them. So, to, uh, to present it more schematically, it is more like this. If we have the uh, overall uh, overall angular momentum, orbital uh, orbital angular momentum in going in one direction and this is for the electron, this is for the L or the orbital angular momentum, then this is much more favored because now there will be no resistance at this particular location. They are rolling just one above the other and they would not assume any friction. But in one case, in the other case, if we have this our L in this direction and the electron is spinning in another direction, then we can obviously see that there will be some friction which is being generated out here. So, that stage is basically unfavorable or not favorable. So, the alignment between the orbital angular momentum and the spin of an electron. So, we have spin of electron and the angular momentum. Uh, so, they should be aligned properly 
so for favor, for, for if the, it is favorable and or unfavorable and that basically leads to the difference in the energy levels that causes basically the splitting between the orbitals so if we had say uh, uh, say we have a particular material then we will see that uh, it will show some splitting in the 3p and 3d uh, maybe in any p or d orbitals and say in particular case we have this binding energy so uh, so it will show some certain splitting say for 3p and say for 3p 2 by uh, 3 by 2 and this will be 1 by 2 so we can see the counts in this direction and the binding energy in this direction we will see some splitting which might be happening between the two or in this two location so for any electron in the orbital with orbital ang angular momentum so coupling between the magnetic fields of the spin and the angular momentum basically causes the splitting between the two and how does this splitting really occurs is as we already discussed it earlier but the overall thing is uh, uh, overall thing out which is uh, determines here is that binding energy of the lower j value j defines the overall mom, uh, momentum of it the angular total angular momentum is defined by j and it leads to degeneracy and degeneracy is basically given by 2j minus 1 so if we have this n l and uh, then the spin and uh, the overall value will come out to be something like if you 1 2 2 say 2 then we have l is 0 in case 0 1 1 the spin can be plus minus half in this case plus minus half plus half minus half so we have we get a uh, over overall uh, degeneracy can be uh, to the order of uh, something like this you can get half we get uh, half 3 by 2 1 by 2 so we can see that there is some degeneracy which is basically occurring out here in, in when we have uh, overall uh, degeneracy is uh, 2j minus 1 then uh, overall degeneracy is coming out it is basically we are seeing uh, the split in this uh, our p orbital uh, so we have this 2p 1 by 2 2 p 3 by 2. So, we are seeing some splitting out here uh, because of the total angular momentum which is being given by the uh, combination of L plus S. So, this overall degeneracy gives rise to the splitting of the peaks and again the magnitude of spin orbit it increases with the atomic number or it also decreases with the distance from the nucleus. So, if the, as the electron is much farther farther from the nucleus then there is much more uh, it is much more uh, the distance uh, the magnitude of spin or uh, splitting will decrease because it is very far from the nucleus so there is uh, uh, increased uh, decreased nuclear shielding uh, from the uh, from the nucleus it is actually uh, will be it will decrease because the uh, electron is very far from the nucleus it will be basically decreased uh, nuclear shielding and again uh, the magnitude of spin orbital splitting will increase with the atomic number and uh, so that is what is defined by the total angular momentum we can see the overall shift out here and in the second case we can also see some chemical shift uh, we can also observe a chemical shift in this particular material like we have titanium 2p 1 by 2 and 2p uh, 3 by 2 so the chemical shift will be different for titanium and titanium 4 plus uh, so that part can be easily seen out here like if we had a peak for two, uh, p 1 by 2 and p 3 by 2 and then uh, it will be very different once we have say titanium and then in other case if we had titanium uh, 4 plus we can see there is some shift in the peaks so for the same peaks p 1 by 2 so it was 2 p 1 by 2 2 p 1 by 2 2 p 3 by 2 and 2 p uh, 3 by 2 so in this case we have titanium 4 plus since titanium is easy uh, it is uh, it uh, it is easy to basically uh, give out electrons we can see that the binding energy will decrease because now we have one more uh, electronegative material which is associated with it so titanium can easily give out electron so its overall uh, peaks will shift in the left direction we can see that particular part that titanium will have certain uh, binding energy whereas titanium 4 plus will have this binding energies shifted to lower value so that what uh, is basically uh, can be easily achieved even can be easily seen via xps so therefore it becomes a powerful tool in terms of uh, being able to detect the functional groups or being able to decide what is the chemical environment and where the species is, uh, is uh, associated and also the oxidation state. So, in, as we can see here the titanium it was uh, neutral and then in this case we had certain binding energy whereas as soon as it becomes 4 plus we see a shift of the binding energy out here. So, that is what is telling that we can 
chemically detect what is happening with the material. So, it becomes a very powerful tool in terms of de de detecting any functional group which is associated with a particular chain or deciding the chemical environment if there is any oxidation is happening with the particular material. So, these are uh, some important uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, characterizing via XPS. And also there can be some core level shifts, uh, like in case we have a carbon and then carbon uh, basically uh, is get interacting with uh, certain materials. So, that can be uh, that can maybe that can be say uh, calcium tetrafluorine or it can be carbon dioxide, it can be CH 4. So, if, if we see that what is the overall binding energy or maybe say let us okay, this will be the kinetic energy in this direction and we have intensity in this direction. In this particular case, we see that the kinetic energy is increasing in this particular direction. So, it, so we have kinetic energy in this direction. So, obviously, the binding energy is increasing in this direction. So, we can directly say that the C F 4 is bonded very much strongly as compared to C O 2 and then C O 2 is much more uh, strongly bound as compared to the C H 4. So, we see C F 4 C F 4 will have the lowest kinetic energy or it means it has the highest binding energy and C H 4 is showing the highest kinetic energy, it means it has the lowest binding energy. So, it also depends on the electronegativity of the material. In this case, we had hydrogen, in this case, we had oxygen, in this case, we had fluorine. So, that is uh, also very important that position of orbitals in the atom is sensitive to the chemical environment. So, that is what we said earlier that uh, shifts are very de much dependent on the chemical environment of the material as well. So, that is what we are able to see in particular spectrum that once a, uh, once a particular element is bounding much more strongly to some uh, another element, so the binding energy will uh, be very high and therefore, will have very low kinetic energy for those particular bonds. So, we can easily decipher the shifts which are arising due to the chemical nature of the material. So, going to the next and therefore, chemical shift is correlated with the overall charge of an atom and as we have reduced charge, we will see increased binding energy. And it also depends on the number of substituents, it depends on the substituent electronegativity, it also depends on the oxidation state. So, uh, again depending on the ionicity or covalence, it can be a little unreliable, but that is what uh, it, it, it depends on, it depends on the oxidation, electronegativity and number of substituents. So, that is all is also being defined by the particular chemical shifts. Uh, okay, coming back to it, we will see. Uh, difference uh, say we can, if we have a particular uh, bonding say C, so C double bond O or C O bond H or C bond O C something like this, they will have different binding energies, may be marginally, marginally different, but they will again be little different, they will have different kind of bondings. In all the cases we have C bonding with O, but still uh, will have very different binding energy. So, typical binding energy of oxygen with cert certain carbon, it uh, again will be little different. Uh, coming to the surface charging, uh, since what happens in, in case of electrical insulators, they cannot dissipate the charges. We are insulating the uh, surface with uh, uh, with uh, photons and then we are uh, basically releasing those electrons from the surface. So, overall the material is getting deficient of any electrons. So, once the material is deficient of any electrons, now it is very hard for a particular material to again emit much more number of electrons. So, we see there is some when the surface charging occurs, we have excess positive charge which basically comes out on the surface and it shifts all the peaks to higher binding energies. So, say if we had certain spectrum and then basically once we are uh, once it is it has a certain charge developing on it. So, we see that the overall binding energy peaks will all shift to the higher binding energy level. So, we have because now it has a some positive charge and now it is very difficult for the charge to go and uh, escape the surface. So, what we do? We tend to reduce uh, the particular charge by inducing a flux of flood, via flux of electrons via flood gun or neutralizer. So, we need to always neutralize this was say actual and once it is becoming positive, it shifts on this direction and we need to supply a flood gun to remain to maintain it at the actual value, but we over saturate in case we over saturate it, then again the binding energy will shift to the left because now in this case we have over saturated with el electrons. So, we have over saturated electrons and binding energy will go little lower value, because now electrons for electrons it is much more easier to escape, since they are anyway having excess surface charges of negative electrons on the surface. So, it is much easier for the electron to go away 
and therefore the binding energy is very very less in this particular case. So that's what we really see in the uh, in the particular spectrum that uh, we had the binding energy, and this is for the actual case. And if we have a charge developing on the surface, we have some positive charge developed on the surface, so it becomes harder for electrons to move. So it basically is increasing the binding energy. And if we supply a flood gun, so we are if uh, if able to maintain it at very low uh, low flood levels, so that uh, it is maintaining the standard uh, level, then we can get the charges at certain binding energy at certain location. But if we oversaturate it, we can see the shifting of uh, those peaks to a uh, to a lower binding energy level. So that what can also be observed. So we should also have a good reference peak to supply the neutralizing gun or the flood gun to neutralize the surface charge which is being, which is being developed. So we need to take care of these things as well in this particular thing. Uh, coming to the experimentation part, obviously we need to have a monochromatic uh, monochromatic X-ray source. So that can be uh, basically uh, generated uh, by using uh, monochromatic source. We can uh, have anode and filaments and then water supply to basically generate a X-ray uh, with certain uh, window level to generate the monochromatic X-ray. And secondly, we also need some sort of a detector or an analyzer and then detector to be able to differentiate the energies which are being uh, achieved by uh, achieved by the electron. So we apply certain bias to uh, certain voltage or certain bias to uh, this analyzer, and uh, the, and we, it allows only a certain energy electrons to pass from one end to the other end, and then get detected at this particular location. So we had this uh, energy analyzer. This allows only certain levels of energy to flow through it without uh, touching the electrodes, and then basically we uh, tap it uh, as a electrode. So we have the sample, we generate the X-rays, we excite the uh, sample, and then the electron photo electrons which are being emitted, they pass through this analyzer, and then they come out at the detector level, and that is basically goes out uh, for uh, for the data processing. And monochromatic source, as we know that we have X-ray source, and they sit on the Rowland circle, uh, Rowland circles where we have a crystal, and that is basically generating the X-ray, and there we have the sample. It falls on the sample, and that is basically uh, that's how we can generate a photo monochromatic source uh, for this uh, particular X-rays. So we have this crystal here, and that is generating the so uh, X, this is the X-ray source, and now, because it is falling on the crystal, we can get a monochromatic source and that basically falls on the sample and all this is all this it is in the on the Rowland circle. So, that is how we can get a monochromatic source and the detector the analyzer what we talked about is uh, something called concentric hemispherical uh, analyzer and in this case we, uh, we have two electrodes on the surface uh, and we set a, apply certain vo voltage to it minus V 1 minus V 2 and if an electron is basically if it is able, it is touching any of the surfaces it is basically absorbed and V 2 is basically greater than V 1. So, we at certain location we supply electron the overall energies and those electrons traverse and they come out on the other side something like this and then this particular thing is getting detected. And once, once uh, we apply it a negative potential and the mean free um, and the mean path through the analyzer is given by V naught and we have certain uh, radiuses like we have R 1, then this is R 0 and this is R 2. So, we get V 1 R 1 which is being dependent on the lower side electrode, V 1 R 1 plus V 2 R 2 which is on the top side electrode divided by the 2 R naught, R naught is the mean radius of the path, the mean radius which is nothing but R naught. So, 2 times R naught gives the overall potential. And if an electron has a kinetic energy which is approximately equal to the V0, will travel a circular orbit with a at a radius of R0. And by changing the V1 and V2, we can allow only a certain range of energy energy values to pass through this particular analyzer. So by changing changing the biases at the V1 and V2, we can uh, alter how which particular electrons will uh, cross through and which one will not. And once we have certain energy of electrons which which comes out, we can detect those electrons by using um, photomultiplier tubes and dynodes, and to basically give a particular count for the particular material. And now here, background correction is also one of the very important part. And uh, so we uh, once we have a background which has uh, because the spectrum shows a stud background, we always need a good correction. So this one is the worst case. 
but if we can start uh, correcting it, so because we had spectrum originally like this, and then if we are able to correct it like this, it is a little better approximation. But if we are, uh, uh, there can be another way of correcting is via joining it a straight line that is little better. But the best will be if we can have a similar kind of a modulation in the background as well. So this is basically the best kind of background which can be corrected out here. Again, there can be surface charging which uh, generates on the surface. So, basically electrical insulators cannot be dissipate charge by photo emission and surfaces uh, basically picking up uh, all the excess charges and excess, excess, excess positive charge since uh, the insulator is not being able to dissipate the uh, charge, it will develop some positive charge charges onto it. Now, it will become very hard for the electron to escape. So, all the peaks will get shifted to a higher binding energy, higher binding energy levels. And again, when it can reduce the surface charge by exposing it uh, through a neutralizing flux or low energy electron gun, which is also called the flood gun. So, that is what uh, thing is all about. And as we uh, uh, realized earlier, that uh, the electron which is being uh, uh, emitting, which is coming out from the surface, it, it will, the probability of electron to come out from the surface will be, the probability of electron which is coming out from the surface will decrease with the depth. So, at around 95 percent of the electrons are coming from a depth of around. So, if this is a depth, they come out from a region of around 3 times lambda. And what is the advantage of this uh, particular thing is, we can alter the uh, angle at which the beam is being incident on the material and then we can detect what is happening at the surface of a material. So, if we had a coating like this and we start incident, incidenting the beam at certain 90 degree and then it is keep starting inclining the particular uh, beam. So, 95 percent of the depth will be around this much. In this case, it might go up to here. So, this is say 3 times lambda, but in this case, this is 3 times lambda. So, we can easily correlate what is the overall depth of a particular layer. So, if we if say if we had a particular depth and then say uh, normally say if this was 3 lambda at certain angle, we can say this one is around 3 times lambda and the intensity which is coming out from there from that we can eventually say what is the overall depth profile of a particular material. So, what is on the surface and what is on the uh, beneath the sample. So, in case in one case if you are getting certain uh, peak for say silicon in a material and then at certain inclination we start seeing some peaks of S i O 2. So, we S i O 2 and uh, then we are, we are after inclining we are able to see S i O 2 it means there is uh, S i O 2 is predominant on the surface. And say if we incline it to an extent, then we can easily see very high peak of SiO2 at say inclination angles of 5 to 10 to 15 degrees, whereas 90 degree P, 90 degree uh, or normal to it will show much higher SI peak and no SiO2. So, this particular uh, technique can be utilized to find the non destructive depth profiling of a particular material. And as we uh, defined, we had defined it earlier by using cos theta. So, in this case it is sin alpha. So, we have sin alpha. Uh, so, we have alpha plus theta is equal to 90 degrees. So, that is what we are being defining here. So, alpha plus theta is 90 degree. Uh, in this case, we have a grazing angle of uh, alpha. So, that is the grazing angle, whereas the theta was the overall uh, incident angle. So, that is what we are uh, able to see difference out here. So, overall depth is dependent on 3 times lambda and again it depends from 90 degree to 15 degree. So, grazing to normal angle we can uh, basically say how much information is coming from how much depth. So, overall we in this particular uh, technique we realize that what is x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So, we learnt about what is x-ray photoelectron and, uh, and how it is different from an OJ electron, because uh, photoelectron will depend the energy of the photoelectron uh, will depend on the incident energy as well, whereas OJ electron the kinetic energy of OJ electron will not depend on the incident energy which is exciting it. And then we realize what is the kind of uh, splitting which can occur because of the orbital splitting and the spin of an electron. So, we did see that uh, how uh, splitting can occur in the uh, orbitals, whereas in S it does the splitting is not present, whereas in P, D uh, and other shells we do see some splitting and that particular uh, lambda which is the mean free path, uh, the overall, uh, the overall uh, interaction, uh, in the overall interaction depth of uh, photo electron extends to the order of 3 times lambda. So, we can also perform a non-destructive depth, pro depth profile via uh, uh, utilizing some grazing angles and that will uh, provide us the chemical composition of the surface. So, with that uh, basically I end my lecture. Thank you.